standing. Today really is part of a series of lectures that um, I have been carrying on with a number of different uh, historians throughout the Americas uh, and Europe and Africa. And really it, um, it came to fruit in 1992. And that was the year when uh, the 500th anniversary uh, celebration of Christopher Columbus landing in America was being celebrated throughout the world. And the native people in America, uh, in the Caribbean region, and many parts of the world felt as a group that really um, the voice of the natives, that the true reality of the history of what happened in, in the world at that time should be voiced, it should be brought forward. Because really people were getting sort of a distorted picture of Columbus himself. And um, so it was really that that really inspired me to really go into this topic uh, on an international basis. But really my search had begun uh, as a young um, African-American growing up in the United States with uh, West Indian background. And also my grandmother is um, Mohawk of the Mohawk Nation, the native people also. So from an early age, I was a little bit confused about my own roots, but then I got it straight and I was basically raised as an African-American. However, the question of self, the question of looking at the television, looking at the movies, and trying to see yourself, bothered me from a long time. Because usually when you would see people of African descent, you would see somebody who um, was telling jokes, like we used to have step and fetcher and different people, they're always uh, you know, in a secondary role. The best position you would get um, up to the 60s really was that you know you would be the sec you would be the the, the, the the secondary actor and you would die like 40 minutes into the movie trying to save the hero of the program people of native descent were usually uh, are portrayed as being villains attacking the cowboys or in a very negative savage position uh, uh, orientals Arabs um, you can go on stereotyping is a great problem being faced. And in Toronto now, and in many parts of America, this is a question that people who are involved in, in education are trying to tackle. How will we educate the younger generation? If we want to try to create the type of society or the type of world where people do not see themselves as enemies because of their nationality, where people are not stuck into little enclaves so that one group can, can viciously attack another group, as we see Bosnia, Herzegovina, we see many parts of the world where people who were once neighbors of each other are destroying each other. So what is it now that, that makes fear in the hearts of one group of people against another group? One of the reasons is because of the, of the lack of understanding that the people have of the heritage and the background of the other group. And so lack of understanding, ignorance, creates fear. And so through knowledge, through, through, through having the voice of all the peoples to be heard in the historical circles, now people in America, in Canada, in the Caribbean, in many parts of the world, are trying to approach education in a different way. In other words, we would allow people to center themselves in other ways, and we would listen to the voice of other people. I used to ask this question as a young person with Christopher Columbus. Because really, when you look at pictures of Columbus and some people up until today think that Christopher Columbus discovered America. I went to Nigeria, Kenya, Southeast Asia, different parts of the world, and I spoke to audience. I said, who discovered America? And they said, Christopher Columbus. I said, when did he discover America? They said, 1492. I said, okay, do you remember the picture of Columbus? Do you see a picture? They said, yes. Were there people in the picture? They said, yes. So Columbus is landing on the shore, people are standing on the shore, okay, he speaks to them in a foreign language that they probably do not understand, he tells them, I have discovered you, uh, I, I christen you, and I control you, and they probably just cooled him down and gave him something to drink. But yet history portrays the fact that Columbus discovered America. This is a mentality that the people are in the picture itself, and you would deny the humanity of the people, deny the fact of their heritage, of, of, of their lifestyle, of their contributions to civilization, and say he discovered America. So really what is happening now, 
many people are actually going through a, a, a revision of historical curricula to try to rewrite the textbooks. And many uh, uh, parts in America, in Canada, in the Caribbean, do not say Christopher Columbus discovered America. They don't say that anymore. They've changed it a little bit. Really, they should say Christopher Columbus was discovered in 1492 because he was lost. He was on his way to India. He thought he was going to India, and he bumped into the Caribbean. On the way, he thought he'd meet the great Khan, and he had translators who could speak Arabic, because Arabic was an international language, and they thought they were in India. That's why he called the people Indians, and it stays with them up until today. But they're not Indians, in the sense of part of the Indo-Pakistani subcontinent. This was another part of the world with its own history and its own culture. So the question is not really to focus that much on Christopher Columbus himself, because Chris really was late. There were other people who came before him. He's not really a significant person. However, they're, they're pushing his name up, really, and, and, and giving him more significance than he actually deserves. What I think is important is to focus on the mentality, the mentality that allows people to accept the fact that he discovers America when there are people standing there. So who discovered the, the Mount Everest? Who discovered the source of the Nile River in Africa? When people were living there for uh, thousands of years, it may be one of the oldest places of human civilization on Earth, but yet when a European uh, explorer reaches there, they say he discovered the source of the Nile. The people knew about it 10,000 years ago. So the mentality that denies the civilization of other people and creates this fear. That is what educators throughout the world are, are, are beginning to work on now to try to, to deal with this because otherwise we will have bo other Bosnia Herzegovinas where you have nations so afraid of each other that they immediately take up arms and they, they, they deny the humanity of the other people in an instant. And so the raising of a new generation where people of different races, nationalities, and backgrounds can understand each other, can tolerate each other, and can live together in a relative amount of peace. Because if we don't do something quick, this whole planet's going to be destroyed. This is the reality that everybody can see looming in the background of the world events. So therefore, Columbus himself, just to start off with, we have to recognize the fact that Columbus himself, it is reported in, in, the, in, the, in the special department of the archives, the Ministry of Education in the Bahamas, which I had the opportunity to go to, that the native population in uh, the, the Bahamas, when he came in 1492, the Lucayans, or the major tribe of natives there, were 50,000 people in 1492. By 1550, they were totally wiped out. In the island of Hispaniola, which is now Haiti, Dominican Republic, 250,000 people were there when he landed. When, when he landed. Three years later, there were 83,000 people left. And so when you start to look at what happened in the Americas, you will realize it was a holocaust. And when we look at the writings of Christopher Columbus, and you can access these writings. You can go to Cambridge University Library, Oxford University, the memoirs of Christopher and Ferdinand Columbus. You can read his writings. And in the memoirs of Balboa and uh, 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 Vasco da Gama, and many of these explorers who went out, really conquerors, conquistadores, that you can read in their writings, you can pull points from out of their writings. The average people don't get a chance to really go into these writings to see what was actually said. So really what I want to do today with you is to give you an idea really of some of the points of history that have been um, kept out of the history books. This is part of, of, of the change now that we hope and pray will come about within the curriculums uh, throughout the Americas, Europe, and the world. That is to begin to look at the world in a different way. Okay, T to begin to look at history from the point of view of all of the peoples of the world. So Columbus himself, um, as I said, actually um, admitted the fact in his writings that he went first, he went to Iceland in the north, he went down to West Africa, and he spoke about in his memoirs 
that he had actually seen dugout canoes with Africans going across. He realized that. And when they came into the Americas, they recognized the fact there were African people living there. And Ferdinand Columbus, in his memoirs, speaks about people when they reached uh, Honduras in Central America, about people, the women had uh, pieces of jewelry, big, thick pieces of gold. And he said it was exactly like the earrings of the women of Mali, of West Africa. And Balboa, many of these uh, conquistadores, they found people of African descent all over the Americas. Okay, but this is something that is not stated in the normal history books. Columbus himself really was part of a wave that was coming out of uh, Portugal and Spain. And when we look at the history of that part of the world, we find that Portugal and Spain had inherited or had seized the history of a civilization that had existed in region for over 700 years. You may be surprised to realize the fact that when Muslims landed there in Spain uh, around 711, Tariq ibn Ziyad, when they landed at the, the, the mountain uh, called Gibraltar now. Okay, in Arabic they say Jebel Tariq. Okay, so Jebel Tariq, Gibraltar. That's where it comes from. Okay, the Muslims landed there at that point and they were responding to oppression. The people were oppressed and they cried out for somebody to liberate them. And the Muslims came, you know, really helping the people who believed in God. They were being attacked by the Visigoths. And so, the Islamic civilization spread into uh, uh, Europe at that point and throughout the world. So the first point really that I want to tackle, just, just to touch on so we have a better understanding before we go into some of the real details of, of the history, is about Islam itself. Because that is misunderstood. Stereotyping again gives you an image of, 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 of different people. Um, when I was growing up, the bad guys were usually uh, Japanese, the Nazis, the Russians were bad. The Indians, of course, were the bad guys in most of the movies. Today, the bad guys in most of the movies are Spanish drug cartels, uh, Jamaican posses, or Afro-American gangs. Uh, but the most sinister character you can bring to the screen would be an Arab terrorist. He seizes uh, the people and he says, I will not... I will not allow you to, 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 to be released until you release my comrades from uh, the prison. So Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, Chuck Norris, and there's a number of heroes who will go into action to rid the world uh, of the new problem. The reality of Islam is really something different. And I work at, as a social worker and also work in education with Muslim peoples in Canada. And there's a large, very large population of Muslims from throughout the world coming into Canada today. And they are really facing a great stereotyping problem. Because Muslims right now make up almost one quarter of the Earth's population. Almost one out of every four people on Earth is a Muslim. It is the majority uh, uh, population in Africa. In China, there may be close to 60 million Muslims. In Russia, the former Soviet states, it may be 60 to 70 million Muslims. In Europe, there are millions of Muslims. In America, or well, the Americas, according to Time magazine, by the year 2000, Islam will be the second largest religion in North America. And so this is not um, a cult or a small group. It is an international understanding. And this is the way it has been from time immemorial. The word Islam itself, meaning surrender or submission to the will of Allah, meaning God with a capital G, is something really that we are taught uh, was shared by people throughout the planet. And the Quran itself says that we have sent prophets and messengers to every nation and every tribe, that they would worship Allah and stay away from false deities. We are also taught that over 124,000 prophets and messengers came to every nation and every tribe. Prophets came to China, prophets came to India, to Africa, to the Americas, to Europe, if you look at the folk traditions of people throughout the world, you will see monotheism. Monotheism is something which is not specialized to Semitic-speaking people or specialized to the Middle East. If you look at the Iroquois writings in America, you will see speak, uh, uh, words being to the effect of the belief in the Great Spirit. In uh, ancient Egypt, Akhenaten 
whose wife was Nefertiti. And his Psalms, the Psalms of Akhenaten, it sounds just like passages out of the Quran and other uh, texts you know, that they refer to the belief in one God, speaking of the different nations, the different tongues, and clearly that we should believe not in the sun, but the power behind the sun, the Creator. Bantu writings, Bantu itself, the end to, the cosmic force. When you go into Bantu religion and writings, you will find that they actually believed in an ultimate superior great spirit also. So monotheism is something that was all over the world. And that really is the essence of Islam. And if we understand that, that will help us to get out of like the stereotyping problem. That, that, that the people get into based upon names or based upon nationalities. In Europe here, when they speak of Muslims, uh, they speak of um, the Moors and the Dark Ages. Um, Othello, even Shakespeare had Othello as one of the Moors, a black man. And so, really, um, when we look at what Isla uh, Islam or Muslims contributed to um, the Western world, it's amazing. In terms of the foundations of this society, in astronomy, Muslims are naturally geared toward astronomy. That is because when we pray, we try to face Mecca. So wherever you are in the world, you have to figure out where you are. And so therefore, the Muslims are really the first people to use what is now the modern day compass, uh, to develop it and use it. Because naturally, every time we pray, we're trying to figure out directions. Also, the pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, means that people have to journey from Africa across deserts, across mountains, oceans. So therefore, geography was another one of the areas that Muslims excelled in. And you find these very deep geography books that were written that give you um, road maps. That, that if you're going from northern India, how do you make it all the way down to Mecca? Some of them actually tell you wh where there are hostile people, where there is water where there are mountains, where there is a desert. It's almost like when you want to travel from California to Boston and you go to the AAA, okay? And then they give you trip ticks. They give you, a, uh, they say, okay, you travel along route such and such, and then you read Texas and you go north, and they give you like a route mapping. This is what Muslims did for the whole world. And so therefore you find um, some of the oldest uh, and best preserved maps in the world were actually done by Muslims. In 956, Al Masudi, a famous geographer, actually drew uh, a map of the world, and on it he had America, Arab Majhula, unknown territory, he said. And there's a picture of it on our, our poster, I believe, uh, showing this unknown territory. This is, this is around 956. Uh, now, of course, we are taught other things. We're taught that, again, Christopher Columbus, that everybody thought the world was flat. Maybe in Europe, okay, that was you know, the, 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 the basic understanding. But in other parts of the world, it was not. The, 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 uh, the, the, the roundness of the earth was well known by Muslims and other people for centuries. In astronomy, the Muslims did things such as um, mapping visible stars to correct the sun and the moon tables, the first use of the pendulum to measure time, observatories, they predicted sunspots, eclipses, and the appearance of comets. In chemistry, um, they discovered nitric acid. They did distillation, filtration, crystallization, so forth and, on, and, and so on. Chemistry is from the word alchemia. Okay. Algebra is from jabr. Trigonometry was developed by Muslims. And you can keep going on and on and on. There's hundreds of words. In medicine, Ibn Sina, his book, The uh, Law of Medicine, was being used in Europe up until the 18th century as one of the chief books in terms of understanding medicine. Navigation, again, Muslims excelled in navigation, and so travelers went throughout the world. When they came into Spain and Portugal, they found it fair-seeming for the planting of citrus fruits. So they planted oranges, uh, grapefruits, lemons, limon is, an, is the word for lemon in Arabic. I realize a lot of this from, from, from studying Arabic and then realizing it you know, from speaking English. The word for, for, for orange in Arabic is Portugal. So Portugal, Portugal. They went north 
and they found a land in the Russian states that was so cold you had to have a lot of sabr in order to live in that place. So they called it out of the sabr, the land of patience, sabriya. So sabriya becomes Siberia. They went down the Red Sea into East Africa and they found a place that the Persians were using as a base of operations in what is now known as Somalia. They said Maqad al-Shah. Maqad would be the, 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 the base, okay, the place of the Shah or the ruler of Persia. Maqad al-Shah, Mogadishu. Musa ibn Beg made a colony down in East Africa. Musa ibn Beg, Mozambique. They went out into the East, uh, uh, into the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea. And they found a, a season of a, 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 a mosim, they call it a mosim, or a season of a lot of rain. So mosim becomes monsoons. They went to the South China Sea. And what is really surprising to find out, that there is a study done by a Harvard University scholar. His name is Barry Fell, F-E-L-L. -L. It's called Saga America. They may have it in the library here in Cambridge. So Cambridge has got a really good library. Saga America. And what happened was that Barry Fell was a linguist. And this is the 50s, going in the 60s. And he was working, he had, there was a lot of pictographs and writings. When different um, uh, buildings were being built all throughout America, and they're like digging into the ground, they start finding things under the ground. And you can go layer by layer, and you start to go back in time. So when these excavations were being done, they're picking up stones with Phoenician writing, uh, stones with, with Latin writing, Celtic writing, I mean the Scandinavian people, all types of writing. Then they start this funny type of scribbling. Nobody knew what it was. They figured it was, it, it was, it was it, some sort of Indian language. Barry Fell came along and recognized there was two things in this. One is an ancient Libyan script. It's North Africa. And the other is what is called Kufic Arabic writing. And they found these inscriptions all over the southwest of America. In Benton, between Nevada and California, they found a, a huge bedrock and it said Ismullah, the name of Allah, written in Arabic, two feet across. They found Muhammad Nabiullah, Muhammad is the prophet of Allah, written in inscriptions all over the southwest of the United States. And they found a map, and he actually has got drawings of this map. Some of the things he's had to put in vaults for fear that people would attack him and try to destroy it. If you go to Harvard University, parts of Cambridge, Massachusetts, then you can get some of this information. And so Barry Fell has got a map which is dated to the 8th century AD. And this map shows Hudson Bay, it goes down to Panama, and it shows the United States. And then it's got this Libyan script and some Kufic writing. And it says that in the Pacific they found these islands they call Juzur al Hawa. And Hawa in Arabic means wind, like it's really windy place, okay, which the Pacific is. And so um, Hawa becomes Hawaii. When they came into the southwest of the United States, and they actually mixed with the native people living in the southwest of the United States, um, we find traces of this civilization amongst the people in Nevada, uh, Arizona, the cliff-dwelling people also, who used to live out there in the southwest, there's all kinds of writings on the walls. This is the way that things are being uh, um, put together now. Because unfortunately, when the Spanish came into America first, they were the first major European group to come in. They destroyed everything. When they came to Mexico City, they burnt down the buildings and they took millions of books. And they took it to the center and they burnt every single book they could find. They did a, like, like a real, real big discredit to history. Everywhere they went, after, after they killed the leader and, 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 and the major military people, they destroyed the books. And so therefore, the writings of the native people are destroyed. What is happening today, however, is that pictographs on walls, there are writings found in different places which, which are coming up uh, periodically. And Barry Fell's work is an amazing work. He took it to Libya. He took it to the scholars in North Africa to try to see 
is this real or am I dreaming? And they looked at the Libyan script and said, this is the real Libyan script. They also found, amongst some of the natives living in the, in the southwest of the United States, they found tattoos on their face at the same configuration as the tattoos of women in North Africa. There was also a tribe that veiled their faces, sort of like these people who live in uh, southern Algeria and uh, the Sahara Desert, Tuaregs, they call them. The Tuareg men veil their face. There's a group in the southwest where the men veil their face, the women don't. The designs on their clothing, adobe, which is really a tube, is really from Arabic. The word adobe is an Arabic word. The adobe houses itself, if you look at the houses in West Africa, or North Africa, Morocco, and Algeria, and the deserts, and you look at the configurations of the houses in the Southwest, the United States, it's almost exactly the same. And so, he came to the conclusion that Muslims had come across the Pacific. They, they, they had known the trade route. They came across the Pacific and entered in on the western side of the United States, mixed with the people who had their own civilization, who, who built their own houses, who had their own languages, and they contributed to the early growth of America. Unfortunately, because of what the Spanish did when the destruction, total destruction, unfortunately, we were not able to access the writings. Um, on the eastern side of the United States, we find that Cyrus Gordon, uh, in his book Before Columbus, is speaking about coins that were found off the coast of Venezuela, 800 AD. You can also probably find this book in, in the Cambridge Library, Cyrus Gordon, before Columbus. Coins were found which, which had Arabic writing on it, and this is dated back to 800 AD. Now, getting into some of the other books now, uh, that same geographer, Al-Mas'udi, Al-Mas'udi Muruj al dahab which is probably in the library here also, Muruj al dahab he speaks about the journey of a man named Khashkhas ibn Sa'id. In 889, he went into the uh, Atlantic Ocean, leaving uh, Andalusia, or what is now Portugal. He went into the Atlantic Ocean, and he came back with a booty, and everybody in Spain knew about the journey of Khashkhas. There's well-known information in Spain. In the 12th century, Al-Idrisi, in his geography book, which is also available, spoke about the journey of a group, a party of eight, Magareba, seafaring people from North Africa, who went into the Atlantic and they found islands, they were captured, they were blindfolded, and the king came and spoke to them through an interpreter who could speak Arabic. This is a 12th century book. al Umari, another book, Masalik al Abra fi Mamalik al Amsar. This is the journey of different enlightened travelers into the different kingdoms of the world. This is a very interesting one, even for people who study African history. Al-Umari writes about the journey of an of, of a African Muslim ruler named Mansa Musa. This is a very important name, Mansa Musa. In 1324, Mansa Musa traveled from the West African Empire of Mali. He traveled across the Sahara Desert he took 72,000 followers with him. They crossed the Sahara Desert. And they carried so much gold with them that they changed the economy of every country that they reached. Just imagine when they had to eat. 72,000 followers. They crossed the Sahara on foot. When they reached Egypt, the, the reporter for al Umari, Ibn Amir Hajib, said to Mansa Musa, where did you get this power and authority from? And Mansa Musa said, I am part of a lineage. And my predecessor, who came before me, Abu Bakr, crossed the Atlantic with 2,000 ships, and he never returned. 2,000 ships. These people of the Mande language group are called Mandinka. Now, we have a saying in the Caribbean, uh, in the south to, I believe, parts of the south, Mandingo. If you're a Mandingo in the Caribbean, it means you're like, you're rough and, you know, you're masculine and you're a Mandingo man, okay? But this idea is coming from this West African group. If you look at the coast, the Guinea coast of West Africa, take look at the map and look at Brazil, you find it's very close. And there are currents that can take you across with no sails. They can, it can take you naturally right across and it lands you in the Amazon River, or it takes you up to Barbados, Trinidad, right into the Caribbean. 
And there was a, a, a Scandinavian scientist, Thor Heyerdahl, who in the 60s piloted his boat, the Ra II. He went from Morocco, he, he, he went along the West African coast by himself, and he went using the currents, he landed in the Caribbean. So he proved conclusively that not only could Muslims have gone across, but even ancient Egyptians before them. It's also used for people who, who, who apply this theory to the ancient Egyptians and the Phoenicians as well. And so the currents existed that could carry people across the Atlantic. And so uh, Abu Bakr left Mali, this is, this is before 1324, with 2,000 ships. 2,000 ships. These are Mandinka. Mandinka writings were found along the, 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 the Amazon River up into Peru, into uh, Panama, Mexico, the southwest of the United States. And there is a Harvard University scholar. His name is Leo Weiner. And the book is called Africa and the Discovery of America. That is the book that really turned on uh, Ivan Van Sertema, Professor Ivan Van Sertema, to get, really get involved in uh, um, the, 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 this, this type of research. This is a Harvard University scholar. And what he showed is that these Mandinka people not only went into Central America and the Caribbean, they made it to the United States. And they were in Arizona, they were in New Mexico, they went up the Mississippi, and they went to the northeast corner of the United States. And some of the Mandinka mounds, they found mounds with writing in it, and the writing is saying, the desert is hot, the birds are numerous, the elephants are tired. They had elephants with them. And they have pictures of elephants in the southwest of the United States. This is amazing information. We don't have access to this, like, like the general population. But it's right there in the universities. And so these Mandinka people, Leo Weiner shows, did business, and they mixed with the Iroquois and Algonquin native populations. So when Columbus came, he was late. People, many people had been before Chris, a long time before him. So when he came into the region, as I said, they found black people in the Caribbean. They found Muslims, they found this writing all around the place. Now, some of them try to write it off. Balboa, who supposedly discovered the Pacific, but people have been living in the Pacific for 10,000 years. When Balboa reached the Pacific, his reporter, Gomara, writes in their writings that the native people, or what we would call Latino people of Central America came, they had a black man, captured, and he had a beard. And so Balboa and, and his people, they said, who is this? And they said, he is from these Tules, or these um, Mandingo people, these ones on the interior, they are fierce, go the other way. So Balboa and his group went the other way. The point is, these people existed in the region. If you study Caribbean history, they tell you about Arawaks, and Caribs. This is how they teach uh, uh, West Indian history. The Caribs are from Guyana, like my friend Faisal. The, Car the, the Caribs are like the rough ones, right? The Arawaks from Barbados, the Bajan ones, they were like easygoing uh, Indians and really nice. And the Caribs chased them from island to island, the Guyanese. They chased them from island to island. They found black people in the Caribbean. The British said, no, it's shipwrecked slaves. This is what they try to say, shipwrecked slaves. But how could these people be all over the region? How could uh, Columbus talk about them and Balboa talk about when they reached, when slavery was not instituted in that time? Africans had no way to get across except by themselves. So that is the reality. And I, I took this, this, this discussion to McGill University, which is the top ge uh, geography department in Canada. They challenged me. And I brought this information, and they backed up. Because it is a reality. But it is just that they have not allowed this to be known to the general population. These people today are known as Garifuna. The Garifuna people, people of African descent, living in the Caribbean region, they, lived, they, were, they were concentrated in St. Vincent, the island of St. Vincent, and Dominica. And so when the British came, the Spanish fought them, the British fought them, French fought them. Finally, the British made a treaty with them and then tricked them and sent them to an island off the coast of Belize. This is, this is British Honduras. 
And so they escape from the Roton Island, and they populate the, the Caribbean side of Central America. So if you go to Central America, you're going to find black people in Central America, not only because they helped to build the Panama Canal, that's what people usually think, but because they were all along the coast, you'll find them. you find them in Honduras, even Mexico. In Mexico, Honduras, uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Panama, Colombia, all on, on, on the Caribbean coastline, there are black people. And, and, and many of them have this language, this Garifuna language. It is not, it is, it is a mixture. It has some Spanish, some French, and some English, but it's an African language. This is one of maybe two or three, two known languages that have been African language preserved in the Caribbean region. Yoruba has been preserved in Cuba through Santeria. You know, like the Obia, the, the magic and the religion, which is really like a West African religion. Now it's used for like voodoo, Santeria. But they, when the Santeria people went to Nigeria, the Nigerians cried. The Yoruba cried because they were speaking classical Yoruba, classical Yoruba language. They had maintained through the Santeria rites in Cuba. So the other African language preserved is the Garifuna language. The Garifuna people now, many of them are entering Islam, and many of them, they, 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 have, they have two wishes. One, that they would be recognized as an independent people in the Caribbean region with their own heritage and history, and two, that they will find out where they came from, from, from which part of Africa they came from. And there is good proof now to show that they may be the descendants of these Mandinka, early Mandinka Muslims who were coming across from West Africa into the region uh, there in the Americas. And so there's a lot of information about this. And I, I don't want to bore you with all the details, you know, the, the archaeological details and um, things dealing with language and uh, so forth. And so I just want to give you a general idea of some of the work that is being done, uh, which is clearly showing that this is now being brought to historical circles in the universities. It is a challenge to the history departments. It is being brought into, into elementary schools, high schools, to try to rewrite the curriculums. But the curriculum is serious. It's serious, man. Because it just creates the mentality of people, right? Because if Columbus didn't discover America, then who did? Okay, now you got a problem. Okay, and so this mentality change now, I believe, is something that everybody, people of conscience, not only people of African descent or Muslims, but people of all races, and nationalities need to now have their voice heard in history so that really people can begin to deal with themselves. And one of the problems going on in America up until now in the black communities in America and the Caribbean is the lack of self-esteem. It's the lack of, of understanding of our own heritage and roots. Because if we, we, we see everybody else in history who don't see ourselves we don't see any, any positive contribution, then we don't think that we can make any positive contribution. So I, I want to end here at this point before it gets too hot in the other room and uh, open up the floor for any questions uh, or observations that you may have had. Okay, the floor is open for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions, please? Uh, please ask whether comments or additions. Uh, I have a yes, question. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an island in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'm not really up on, uh, totally up on, but I've heard that there's like an island in the Philippines where uh, the majority of the population is, is Muslim. And also, I know that there are some Filipinos who are black as well. Right. Or there's a connection between yeah. that and Africa, or is there a connection mm -hmm. between the majority of those people that are Muslim? Are they mostly black, or are they just... Right. They okay, what it seems as though, from my understanding now, the aboriginal population of the whole of Southeast Asia were Africans. And it's clear in Australia, because you see what they call aborigines in Australia. But you will find the same aboriginal people, the original people, you find this all over Southeast Asia. I was in Malaysia, and I got into the elevator, and this uh, Afro-Malaysian got in with an Afro like this, looking like he came from America or the Caribbean, and he's talking Malaysian. I said, brother, who is this? He said, Orang Asli, which means the original man in Malaysia. And these African people live in certain sections of Malaysia. Everybody knows them. 
He said, the people you see, the present-day Malaysians, are Thailandis. They came from the north, from Thailand, and other parts of the north, and they colonized Malaysia. And they drove these people to the coastlines. So you find in all the islands, Indonesia, Philippines, you will find um, that the native population actually was African people who more than likely migrated out of Africa itself, which is now clearly proven archaeologically, anthropologically, and, and, and historically to be the actual seedbed of humanity. Okay? And most historians are, are starting to submit now, because it's clear. So, so Homo sapiens now coming out of Africa and going to different parts of the world and then settling into that Southeast Asian region probably is the reason why you have those black people there uh, in the Philippines. In terms of the, of the Moors, or it's this island Mindanao. Mindanao was the island. And um, when the Spanish came across, when they were conquering the world, and they reached there, they saw, Muslim, they said Moros, like Moors. So up until now, they called them Moros. Okay, from the, in the Spanish language. So what it, what, all it was was that Muslims had gone there, missionaries had gone there. No armies went there. Contrary to, to all this propaganda about Islam conquering the world by sword, no. Missionaries went there, people of, of knowledge and business people. And, and they just did business with the people, they intermarried, and Islam spread. The largest Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. So really, there's more Muslims in Indonesia than like the whole Middle East. So Southeast Asia has always been like one of the strongest places of the presence of Islam. So uh, Mindanao, the Philippines, you know, Indonesia, all of it is part of what used to be a former um, Islamic empire, actually. It was an Islamic empire that was there. And so um, the people there are very strong Muslims and very much involved in their, um, their roots and, 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 and their independence in Mindanao. Yeah. Any other questions that anybody has? I believe so. I believe so. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. But you're even with the Japanese too. There was, there was a, a a group of people that were there, and they came from the mainland and colonized and drove these people off. And so they act. All those areas speak about this Aboriginal group that that really was there, populating all the island areas there. Right. And work is actually being done now. Um, there's a brother in Canada who's doing work actually about the British Isles, that the Moors, what they call the Moors area, and so the ancestry of a lot of the people here. When you really go back, you will find an early African people in the British Isles. Early, there was an African people living here. Right, when they had, yeah, this was the Moors, yeah, when the Moors were there, yeah. Yeah, this is another time. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, this, this, this is not, I mean, from the historical point of view, this is not to try to say, I am better than you, and we're here first, and you know, no. The re but just tell the truth. That's all I'm saying. Let everybody have their contribution. We recognize the present world civilization. But tell the truth, man. Like, you know, with, with, with children here in Canada, we even reached the point, we had all these people there. So I said to the children, um, where does spaghetti come from? What kind of food is spaghetti? They said, Italian food. I said, oh yeah? Where do noodles come from? China. Okay, where does uh, uh, tomatoes come into Europe? Right from the Middle East. Where does your oregano and your spices come from? From India. Okay, so it was an ingenious Italian who took the culture of China, India, Middle East, Africa, and put it all together and made spaghetti and meatballs. Okay, so all it is, is a mixture of the cultures of the world. And that is the same way it is with technology, the same way it is with, with the languages, all different aspects of civilization. That's, and that's all you know, we're saying now. Just tell the truth. Just put things in the proper perspective so people can appreciate each other. Man. But then each group can appreciate each other. And then not like be afraid of each other. And one group feels, I am the best human being, and you're not another good human being. Everybody is human. Right? There's different aspects, you know, from our point of view, an Islamic point of view, we're all part of the same family. That's the reality of the situation. Okay, but there's these artificial divisions that have been set to divide people into nations and groups to continue, like, warring against each other. Okay, like, history is very important for us, you know, to when we read history, question the history book. 
question it. Go to another place and get another book and check out what he said to make sure he's telling the truth. We used to say in the 60s, like many people know, we used to say his story, right? It's not my story, man. It's his story, right? Okay, but we want our story, right? We want everybody's story. You know, the word history is from Arabic, from Ustor. Asatir al-Awaleen. It means the stories of those who came before, Ustor. That's an Arabic word. So many Arabic words have been, you know, changed through language, Latin, German, or Spanish, and then into the English language. You'd be surprised to know how many words there are. Right. Hashishi Yun, right. This is a special group. Right. Hassan al-Sabah. This one, he had that group up in uh, Alamut, up in Syria. Right, and he had the, the assassins up there. They were smoking hash, and he was sending them out to hit people. <laughs> right, that's right. Yes, brother. Okay, this is a very good question. Because actually, what happened was, we can see, that when the Spanish came in especially, and they colonized you know, uh, the, the region there, then they destroyed all the books and they started taking over. And eventually, what happened is around the 16th century, the 17th century, you have what is called color codes. In the Caribbean, Code Noir, the black code. Because when the first colonists came to America, there were black people there. And some black people, they had slaves, or they had, they had plantations. Black people came before slavery to America, but slavery was first tried on, the, on, 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 the, on white, poor whites, but it didn't work. They tried it on the native people, they ran away, or they died. Then when they found it was fair seeming to bring in people from Africa, way far from their continent, easy to detect, you know, can work in, in a plantation, you know, had good idea of agriculture. Then they brought, you know, our people African. They made laws to say anybody who was African is now a slave. So therefore, anybody, whether you are part native, the Seminoles, or whatever nation you were, or part, part black, whatever you were, once that code came in, you became slave. That was the end. And so race around the 17th, 16th, 17th century, especially 17th century, it became the crucial issue was color. The dictionaries are changed. So when you see the word black in the dictionary, in the past, the Greeks and these other people, they had no problem with color. They said, yes, we got our civilization from the Egyptians. They were black, dark people with woolly hair. They had no problem. Herodotus, the Romans, none of them, they didn't have a problem. Okay, but when color is now used as a means of slavery, Okay, then, in the dictionary, the word black becomes uh, evil, uh, gloomy, dirty, all these things come with black. And white becomes innocent, holy, and pure. So therefore, that, that is a place value being put upon um, color itself. Okay, and so that really became a very, very crucial thing, and so therefore, they, they were lost. What, 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 we, what, what we say is that they were melted down in the melting pot of America. It's like a melting pot. Because in the slavery period, right, and we didn't have time to go into that today, but in the slavery period, actually, um, you know, there were, there were many Muslim slaves, about 30% of the slaves were Muslims. There was Ashanti, there was Yoruba, there was Angola, there was Wolof, there was many Akan people, there was many different nations, and they had different tongues. But all those languages, it was prohibited to speak those languages. They stopped you from speaking it. If you made your worship or your prayer, you would, you would be killed. And so therefore, after a period of time, people melted down. And they could only maintain a form of Christianity. It had different rhythms in it and different things and underground groups. They kept something going, but it, you know, they, lost, they, they, were, they were lost the actual details of the religion. So the early explorers, the ones who came with the Spanish, many came along with the Spanish, that's another whole lecture, slavery period, all of it melted down. Some people though, in their families, they can trace back something different. There was a brother uh, who, who just died this year, uh, may Allah have mercy on him, Nafia Muhammad from Philadelphia. His, uh, he was from Georgia, and his uh, great-grandmother was in slavery. 
And so they can remember that when the slave master in Georgia was mad, he said, you ain't nothing but Aunt Haggis, illegitimate children. Now, what that in means if you interpret that from English, Aunt Haggah is Hajar, right? Meaning the wife of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, Abraham. So when you say the Aunt Haggis, illegitimate children, you're Arabs, you're Muslims. That's what he was calling them. Aunt Haggis, illegitimate children. When he was getting mad at them. Okay, so you find a lot of things like this in this documentation, but unfortunately, it, it was like melted down. People really didn't know. Um, you know, what the roots were, and, and some people are bringing back aspects of the roots. And there's a lot now in reinterpreting um, posters. We're talking about slaves. Some of the historical documents now are being reanalyzed in the South. Because if you look at it with other eyes, you'll see other things in it. You'll see names being changed. Even some Muslim names, they say, for instance, this is a heavy one. There was a Muslim slave named Bilal, Bilali, Saleh Bilali, he was living off uh, uh, in the islands, the Gula Islands, off the coast of uh, South Carolina. And he had like 19 children, and he used to make his salat all of his life. He wore a fez, he used to read the Quran, he used to make his salat, okay? Um, there was a movie that somebody put out, the sisters of the, forget the name of it, but they, but they had him in the movie. Right, the one that was down in on all those... Um, Gula Island, the Gula Islands, and they had him making the salah with his fez on and whatnot. He had 19 children. So they say there was a book that came out. There's a historian who did a book, and he said the name Bilali became changed around to be Bila, Bila, and in the next generation they called it Bailey. So anybody who has the name Bailey, who comes from South Carolina and that region, is probably a descendant of Saleh Bilali. Bailey, that's your name, because there was no slave master with the name Bailey who could have given it to all the slaves on the plantation. Nobody had Bailey, because he went back and checked the rip. His name was Robert Thayer. Now check this out. He checked out one famous African uh, 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 activist, and he found out that his name was Frederick Augustus Bailey. He changed his name to Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass is from the Bailey family in South Carolina, which means he probably was a Muslim. Now that is mind-boggling for history, right? Another one, Brother Suleiman Yang, Dr. Suleiman Yang of Washington, D.C., who's a Gambian. He teaches at Howard University. He checked, was checking out things and seeing there's a name, Abu Bakr, in West Africa becomes Bubakar. Bubakar, they say. And Bubakar, they see the linguistic change into Bukar. So some people who took the name Bukar also is from Abu Bakr. These are linguistic changes that have happened in the names. Okay, so, you know, his idea, I mean, if Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass were Muslims, this is serious. This is serious. But there's a lot of things, even with Ashanti, even with uh, Yoruba, and, and you will see these linguistic name changes that go on. That is part of, of the, the reclaiming of heritage. But unfortunately, um, there was a meltdown process. And it's like, it's almost like uh, amnesia. Like we have amnesia, like our memory is just gone. Man. It's a matter of like piecing it together now um, to get the roots to go back, you know, to, to, to the early history of the people. And this passage is saying Noah had three sons, and when Noah got drunk on wine, one of his sons laughed at him, and the other took a sheet and walked backwards and threw it over Noah. Noah told one who laughed, you children will be ewers of wood and drawers of water for the other two's children, and they will be known by their hair and skin being dark. Okay, so miss, there we are. And that is the way God meant us to be. We have always had to follow the white folks and do what, and do what we see them to do. And that's all there is to it. You just can't get away from what the Lord said. Gus Rogers. This is a testimony from a slave. Okay? Yeah. So, so this, 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 you, you'll see a lot of this, you know, the brainwashing and the things that went on. Okay? Any other questions? If there was brothers, if he had skin that was dark, they all had dark skin, right? Of course. I mean, this really is, is, is not... You see, when racism came into history in the 16th, 17th century, 
this is when they started changing even biblical textbooks. So Satan became the dark prince. Everything dark became like evil, right? And so this is where color color was, was superimposed into this Bible. This we, we Muslims, we do not believe this is the original teachings of Jesus. This is something that's imposed into the book to propagate racism. And then you have a picture of Jesus himself, right? Who's probably Michelangelo's uncle or somebody that he drew in the Sistine Chapel. So everybody draws that picture of Jesus. That's not what Jesus looked like. One time I was I was in a Catholic retreat. There was a Catholic priest who was losing his children, teenagers. So he asked me to come in and talk to his teenagers. Okay? And so when we were talking, I started talking about Jesus, what he looked like. And the student said, wait a minute, what did Jesus look like? And the priest said, I'm going to agree with, with Mr. Hakim. I'm going to agree with him. He was probably medium height person. He had broad shoulders, big hands. He was a carpenter, right? Tough feet. He had hair like lamb's wool. Okay? It is not, he's a Semitic Middle Eastern person now. Different kind of features. What you see in the picture is Michelangelo's uh, uncle. Okay? So the reality is that is racism. In order to get, dominate one, if you say that's God or the Son of God, and that looks like a particular race, then you will now deify the race. That's a psychological thing. But race is not supposed to be part of the message. It was never part of the early message, that one color over another color. That's not part of the message. That came in when race became the key issue in terms of dominating people's minds. And that is what has to be rooted out of institutionalized religion, and the educational system, all of these things have to be rooted out if people are going to deal with each other in a normal way. Otherwise, we still have these perversions, one group uh, against another group. Any other questions anybody has? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. They had that, um, I guess, African they changed, and they had mm. history Well, it appears that they came from uh, Asia itself. Uh, he probably across the Bering Straits were Alaska, to Alaska. At one point, that was land. And so they came across there from Mongolia. Okay, and they came and they populated, and also from the Pacific itself, the islands. They came because many people who live in Central America, they looked like people from Polynesia, like Hawaii and all those islands did. So they came in from the islands and then they came in the north. I like that, migrated down and settled, and then went, this is thousands of years ago. Okay, so they, they have their own origin, they have a different origin. And they have their own civilizations, their own languages. W what happened when the black people came there, or Africans, and when, when the Semites came, Phoenicians, they only added something to the civilization that was already there. They didn't create the civilization. They added to the people's civilization. Probably the pyramid building was something that the Africans had known because the pyramids in Egypt you know, were the greatest pyramids on earth and are still are the greatest pyramids. So, so they, their contribution was probably in this pyramid building and then in uh, and certain aspects of medicine and certain aspects of science that they had from ancient Egypt. The Phoenicians were a seafaring people who came from what is now like Lebanon and they all around the Mediterranean. They were the ones who probably carried uh, the Egyptians across uh, at that point. So everybody has their contribution that they made, but the native people in the Americas actually have their own roots and their own uh, separate language. Yes, brother. Yes, uh, what was this is a very good question now, and like there's a lot of debate about Columbus. When I was in the Caribbean, you, you're going to be surprised to know this, when I was in the Caribbean, um, we had an interfaith conference, inter group, I was in Jamaica, and we had an interfaith, inter-ethnic uh, uh, historical conference, and the Jewish group, the rabbi, came, the chief rabbi on the island, made his historical thing, he said, Columbus was Jewish. Well, this is serious. And the money lenders in Venice, right? He got his money, the people he got his money from. What was happening is that the Spanish had what they called the Inquisition. And when they came down and they conquered the Muslim land, anybody who was not a Catholic, they burn you at the stake. 
So therefore, the, the Jews who, who, who are, they call, who, who hid their identity, were called Morenos, and the Muslims, Morescos. And so they were trying to flee. They were trying to leave. Because in 1492, just before Columbus went, thousands of Jews were actually expelled from Spain. Thousands of them. This is one of the big events in 1492. So one of the theories is that Columbus was bringing across um, Jewish people and other people who were fleeing from the Inquisition. That was one of the reasons why he was going across. Now, there's a lot of theories. There's a man named Bradley, Thomas Bradley. He's from Canada, from Halifax. And he has another book. He has another, this is his theory uh, about Columbus, why Columbus went across. And there's a lot of theories why he really went across. This thing that you get in the public, this is propaganda. There's all kinds of other reasons, all kinds of things were going on in terms of you know, making that journey across. So one of it may be that he was transporting refugees across from the Jewish population and from other people who were fleeing, who were not Catholics and they were fleeing from the Spanish Inquisition. That that may be part of the reason why he particularly went across. And his navigator, Rodrigo de Triana, was Moresco. He was a Muslim hidden, who had hid his identity. He was the first person to sight land. He could speak Arabic and Mandinka, one of the West African languages. Because Columbus knew he was going to, or thought he was going to run into somebody who either spoke Arabic or Western. So he carried da, Rodrigo with him. Yes, brother. Turkey because Well, um, I'm not sure of his journey to, to Turkey. I know that West Africa he journeyed to. And in West Africa, there's a, um, uh, I think his name is ah, uh, Ahmed ibn Majid. He's a famous uh, astronomer, navigator, scientist who actually helped a lot of the Portuguese uh, um, conquerors. Um, uh, uh, Vasco da Gama and these people who went around South Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. They were hoping to go around the Muslim world, right, to get to India. So, I mean, it was Muslims showed them how to get around there. So Columbus went into West Africa and also uh, conferred with these uh, historians there. And when the Portuguese set up their schools of navigation, they were basing it upon the Muslim navigation that had already been there. Because the Muslims, again, like I said, were the first people to use the compass. You know, they had gone back and forth regularly. It was well known. Okay. So there is a map in 1513, Piri Raisi map, that dates back to 1513. And that map um, is in uh, Turkey, in, in Istanbul. And that map has got a detailed uh, uh, picture of the South American coastline. Van Sertima, um he always refers to this map. This is probably the, the, the most hard, the hardest evidence a pre-Columbus presence of, of Muslims, be, you know, it's hard evidence because it shows the coastline details, and that's 1513. So how can you get that information if Columbus just discovered the place in 1492? So true, the Turks he he, he had used other maps before, so there were maps being used by the Turks and by the uh, Spanish, Muslims, Andalusians, North Africans. They all had access to maps. But unfortunately, through the wars and the different things, these maps have been destroyed. We don't have access to, the, to these, these, a lot of these maps now. Why is it that, or what is it that Islam has got to offer the most Americans yeah. that Christianity or Judaism has not to offer? Right. Well, you know, it, 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 it appears that, um, you see, again, um, amongst the African Americans and, you know, many of the people in America, the, you know, people want, are searching for roots. And really, you know, trying to look at Africa and trying to look at history in a, in a more, you know, uh, general, objective way. And so, when you look at Africa, you will see you immediately you you, you will see the, the great contributions that Muslims made, especially in West Africa. Um, and so, that appeal is still there. Also, within um, African American history, you know, Muslims from the time of, of the slavery period, as quiet as it's kept have played a very important role and have been known. Um, and you can actually trace revolts that went on in the slavery period. You, you can trace the presence of Muslims when uh, Afro-Americans migrated to the Northeast cities. And there are a number of groups that formed in the Northeast, the Morris Science Temple Law. Uh, and there are a number of groups that formed. So, I mean, Muslims have always been part of African-American culture. It's always been there. And so therefore, um, you know, with all the other options being cut off, that option still remains as a very strong option. 
And in terms of family structure at this point, those who are interested in family, Islam has shown, and Malcolm X's example shows, other people, in terms of cleaning up your life, reforming yourself, getting your family together, you know, having a good world view, right? You know, you know, connecting yourself with other nations. That Islam is one of the easiest ways for for um, uh, uh, African Americans, especially, to connect with people in Africa and other parts of the world. When I went into Africa, because I, I spent time in Nigeria and Kenya and other places, okay, they look at us in America and they say, like, what tribe are you from? I had on a turban and a big thing like this. I went into Nigeria to a conference. Okay, and like, because I guess my mixed complexion, I look like people in the desert, in the Sahara. There's these desert people, right? So this man comes up to me and his thing, he said, who's your father? So I looked at him and I said, hey, wait a minute, man, I'm from America. He said, no, who is your father? I said, okay, my father's name is Earl. You know, then he went, oh, man. <laughs> he was expecting to hear something else, right? But, when, but, but if, if you go to Africa like a tourist, and you get your camera and you're looking at the natives and everything, they look at you in the same way as other people who are coming there just to like exploit them, right? But if you go there with Yoruba religion, Ashanti religion, with Islam, with something that is native to the land, they can relate to you. They relate to you right away. They open up their house. Okay? And so that is another reason why, in terms of roots, it is a natural thing for African Americans to evolve into a state of Islam. Not this propaganda and all this terrorism, that, that's propaganda. I'm talking about a way of life where you, you, know, you clean yourself up, you're honest, you're decent, you have good family life, you have good structure, you know, you're, you're, you're into education and science, you're a world traveler. These are the positive parts of Islam that, that still you know, offer one of the best alternatives to, uh, to uh, people in America. Yes, but long lost brother, everybody one man who comes here, come Yeah. So this is the reason why. I mean, like this year the the, the Heinzman trophy winner on the football player is Muslim. Um uh, uh Hakeem Olajuwon, most valuable player, I mean again really he's supposed to be the most valuable player anyway. He was. And so this is, it's becoming a common thing. Mike Tyson now, a lot of people don't like him. But I mean, you know, Islam you know, helps you know, Mike Tyson to like get himself together. That's the reality, and he's going to tell you. I clean myself up. You know, this is how I get myself together. I'm a Muslim. Doesn't mean I turn into a wild man. I'm cooled out now. Okay, and so it's, it's a natural uh, evolution which is happening, which I, I don't think any propaganda is going to really stop. It might slow it down a little bit, but it's not going to stop. I mean, the positive aspects of Islam. Because the positive aspects are there, what it's supposed to be, as long as it's taught, you know, uh, properly. Okay. Any other questions that anybody has? Yes, sister. Yeah, the Moors really is a color thing. It's it's a word used by Europeans to say like these are like colored people. But the Moors, the Moors were Muslims. Yeah, whenever, whenever, you use the, whenever the European used the word Moors, it actually meant Muslims. But Moors were not just Africans. There were Persians, there were uh, even Europeans, there were different Arabs, there were different types of people who were Moors. It's like a mixed group, because Muslims are like a mixed racial group. But still, it was, you could say, color. So they used this Moros word, it's, like, it's, it's, it's referring to color, to the color of the people. Mauritania is referring to the color of the people. They're like brown people or black people is what it refers to. No. It's just like the word negro itself is negro, black. So it's a color. So that was put upon people of African descent. Instead of using your, your, your original tribe or your language, what you were, then they say you're, you're negro, which means you're black. So you're a color group. So, but when you do that now, you, you, you don't say the yellow people for the Chinese. You say he's Chinese American, or he is uh, uh, Indian East Indian American, or he's Irish American. They say he's Black American. Why does it change into a color? See this point? You see, and so that's the reason why. Um, be like this: the same word. This word is like a general word which is being used, which doesn't give justice to what the person really is. But the Moors were Muslims, and that Robin Hood movie. Um, did you all see that movie, Robin Hood? That was interesting. 
because like the role that he played, you see what he was doing. He performed the um, circumcision, I mean the, I mean the, the cesarean uh, birth. Um, he knew about what gunpowder. All, all he had the telescope. You know all the things. That's the science, man. That's the science. That the Muslim dead. But at the same time, in the beginning, they show a terrible thing of Muslims, like Turks, chopping hands off and heads and everything. Like, you're frightened and you're out your mind when you're in the Muslim world. Heads is just being chopped off. That's propaganda. That's propaganda. Okay? So, um, any other questions that anybody has? We wanted to also present on behalf of uh, the brothers uh, uh, who came here today. Uh, for everybody here, uh, a gift from us is a tape. You can have it. It's an, it's an audio tape. Um, and, and that is the lecture here that I gave. I did this in um, State University of New York, Binghamton. And it gives even more. It's like a long lecture that I did there with all the information and even more. Talking about the, the thing that Van Sertima did about the Olmecs, the Egyptians. So that's all on the tape there. So everybody can take a copy of that tape, uh, in the free of cost from us, uh, as, as, as a sign of appreciation. So thank you very much uh, for your patience.